Welcome to the IDEX Continuing Education Series. Hi, I'm Dr Natalie McNabb, Professional Services Veterinarian for IDEX in Southern Australia. Welcome to the IDEX Continuing Education Series webinar on understanding reference intervals in clinical practice. The desired outcome from this session is that you will leave with a good understanding of how population-based reference intervals are created, the merits of creating individual-based reference intervals, and some top tips on interpreting individual analytes so that you reduce the chance of under- or over-interpreting changes. Let's start by talking about population-based reference intervals and how they are created. To establish population-based reference intervals, blood is sampled from a large number, which is defined as ideally a minimum of 120 animals of a particular species using a mixture of breeds, ages, and ideally a relatively even split between the genders. They are deemed to be healthy based on history and physical exam. We then collect blood from each of them in exactly the same way. So that means we use the same vein, technique, needle and syringe size, etc. The samples are then all handled and stored in exactly the same way so that they can be run at the same time on the same machine. The standard is that reference intervals include a mean plus minus two standard deviations as shown here. So this means that the standard reference interval is going to include 95% of the population and therefore we are going to be excluding 5% of results from clinically healthy animals. So that will be 2.5% down the bottom and 2.5% up the top. Thus, this will lead to 5% of normal patients having a result outside of the reference interval for any one test. When numerous tests are run on the same animal, the chances of obtaining one or more slightly abnormal results on an animal that are actually normal rises. Therefore, if you have a panel of say 20 tests, it is likely that one will be abnormal as a matter of chance or normality versus disease. What this means is that small deviations outside the reference interval may not actually be clinically relevant. In other words, clinically healthy animals may have mildly reduced or mildly increased analyte concentrations or activities compared to a reference interval, but the values are actually normal for that animal. Therefore, we can have normal animals that will have abnormal results and conversely, we could have ill or sick patients that will have normal results. So this raises the question of whether a result within the reference interval is in fact normal for that patient because sometimes it's the lack of an abnormality that raises our suspicion for disease. For example, patients with hypoadrenocorticism usually lack the presence of a stress leukogram we would typically expect to see in sick patients. Remember, we always need to consider all diagnostic test results in relation to our patient's history and physical exam findings. So we ultimately need to think to ourselves, do they make sense for this particular patient? So how do you know whether obtaining a value outside the reference interval is clinically relevant? This is one of the particular challenges for data analysis for both new graduates and experienced vets. And unfortunately, there simply aren't details in this um, in textbooks. And it's something that really we just start to pick up by experience, but there are some general rules of thumb that we can use. Firstly, the degree of change or what we call the clinical decision limit is published. The American Society for Veterinary Clinical Pathology, their website is a great source for this. But when you're not sure, of course, there's always the option to phone a friend, which in the case of IDEX means that you can call up and speak to one of IDEX's friendly pathologists. The clinical decision limit for any given analyte will be somewhat dependent on the analyte itself. For example, as shown by these uh, little panel of results down here. A mild increase in something like creatine kinase or the liver enzymes is probably not going to be diagnostically relevant. Ultimately, again, it will depend on our patient's clinical signs. 
However, something like uh, electrolytes, for example, they are maintained within fairly narrow limits and therefore small alterations are likely to be more clinically relevant. Again, will depend on our clinical signs and other findings. So we always need to be interpreting in light of what we know about the case. However, if we are ever in doubt as to whether an abnormal test result is a disease associated finding, it's always a good response to retest to see if the identified change is persistent or potentially getting worse. Of course, the interval between testing may be a little bit subjective and is going to depend on the test. For example, if we have abnormal results in the hemogram, then it's pretty reasonable that we would look at retesting in, say, 24 to 48 hours. However, um, if we're looking at liver enzymes, then we might be considering retesting in one to two weeks' time. We also need to consider the sample quality. So ultimately, we need to check for the presence of interfering substances or artifact. Let's take, for example, hemolysis. The effect of hemolysis is variable and may be unpredictable on some analytes. While some changes are consistent, for example, CK and AST will usually increase with hemolysis, whilst ALKP, ALT and SDMA will decrease, other analytes will vary. The effect of hemolysis can also be to reduce high results to within the normal range and a profile that has no results outside the reference interval uh, may still be unreliable. With regards to profile collation, it is important to interpret changes in combination with other clinico-pathologic findings as abnormalities in one organ system may cause abnormal results in tests that are used primarily to indicate disease in a different organ system. Lastly, Remember, we always need to interpret the laboratory data with respect to what we know of the patient. Ultimately, does it make sense? If you find yourself questioning and saying, I don't know, then a good um, approach is to consider repeating the testing, uh, particularly if you are concerned about that result, say something like increased ALT activity. If we think about it, we are asking, particularly for dogs, our population-based reference intervals to cover a lot of differences uh, with regards to breed, sex, age, and then, of course, physiologic status. And these can all play significantly in how we're going to end up interpreting our patient data. Biological variation is the random fluctuation of the laboratory results for an individual measurement around a homeostatic set point. And this can potentially be as much as 15 or 20% within a week or so. Craig Ruo and colleagues at the College of Veterinary Medicine, Oregon State University, recognized that the degree of biological variation in routinely measured biochemical analytes had not been well-defined in client-owned pets. So they conducted a prospective study using a group of clinically healthy owned and privately housed dogs to estimate the biological variation in routinely measured biochemical analytes in clinically healthy dogs. The study population was 11 dogs of varying breeds, age and sex. All dogs were considered clinically healthy on initial physical exam and based on lack of owner reported signs of disease. And given that they were owned by staff and students at the College of Veterinary Medicine, it was deemed that they should have a fairly good idea as to whether or not their pet would be healthy. None of the uh, animals had any history of prior significant disease. All dogs were maintained in their home environment, so they were being fed their normal diet and physical activity was allowed at the owner's discretion. To minimise pre-analytical variability, blood was collected from each of these dogs using a standardised technique and process daily for seven days, then weekly for six weeks, and then at three months. So a total of 14 samples were collected from each of the 11 dogs. Upon collection, samples were then stored in exactly the same way so that they could be analysed at the same time on the same machine once all the samples had been collected. In addition, each panel was performed twice on each sample so that we could get an estimation of analytical variability. For each analyte, the analytical variability, which is uh, defined as CVA, the intra, 
individual variability, CVI, and the inter-individual variability, CVG, were calculated. The ratio of individual biological variation, CVI, to group biological variation, CVG, is referred to as an analyte's index of individuality. This index determines the suitability of an analyte to be assessed in relation to population or subject-based reference intervals. An index of variability of less than 0.7 indicates that comparison of an individual to a population-based reference interval is appropriate, whereas an index of variability greater than 1.7 indicates that a population-based reference interval is of limited utility. So based on this criteria for this particular population of dogs, we can see that use of a population-based reference interval is marginally appropriate for serum glucose and total triglyceride concentrations, but becoming a little bit questionable for serum phosphorus. We can see that for the remaining analytes, the index of individuality is greater than 1.7. So this means that a population-based reference interval is of limited utility. So the conclusion from this study was that many frequently measured analytes included in routine serum biochemical panels do have high variability. So if we use standard reference intervals to monitor changes over time in an individual, then we may potentially miss meaningful biological change. So definitely population-based reference intervals are a good starting point, but I'm sure you can appreciate we are going to gain an extra layer of information when we use individual-based reference intervals. When the variation within an individual, so that's CVI, is less than that in the population, so CVG, this means that the population-based intervals may not be the best method of detecting an abnormal test result in that individual. In Ruo's study, this was the case for ALT. The uh, variation within an individual, CVI, was 19.5%, whereas the variation um, in the population, CVG, was 70%. In this scenario, a change in the individual animal's result from an established baseline for that animal may in fact be the best way of picking up a test abnormality that is due to disease. This change, called the reference change value, also known as the critical difference, gives rise to the subject base uh, reference value. So if the test result changes from baseline more than the reference change value, this supports a true change versus one that is simply just due to chance. And in Ruo's study, in the case of ALT, for example, that critical change value was 47.7%. So how do we then go about creating individual reference uh, intervals for our patients? It's relatively straightforward in that what we wanna do is take blood samples when the animal is deemed to be healthy, so as best as we can assess based on history and physical exam, and we ideally want to collect two to three sets of data before that animal is deemed senior, so roughly when they're in that one to seven year age range. We can therefore use that pre-anesthetic test result that was normal in the three-year-old dog that we performed the routine dental on, or that six-year-old dog that needed a mass removed. In these situations, the pre-anesthetic test result not only provides value in terms of us being happy that it is safe to proceed with the anesthetic on that day, but in fact, most of the value uh, in these normal results will in fact come in the future as the animal ages, as they will help create the patient's individual reference interval that will then allow us to identify disease earlier, potentially before the patient has even developed clinical signs. We ideally want to collect uh, samples when our patients are fasted because population-based reference intervals are created, created on fasted samples. And as we have already discussed, it will reduce the effect of interfering substances or artifact such as lipemia, which will ultimately allow for more meaningful comparison of our patient's results with the population-based reference intervals. And we can do this using IDEX's Vet Connect Plus portal. For those of you who are not overly familiar with Vet Connect Plus, it really aids you in being able to get the most of your patient's results, particularly when it comes to creating individual reference intervals. 
Here we are looking at the results for this little dash hound, motor mouse, and we're going to focus on creatinine for the sake of this example. And you can appreciate that if we just simply uh, had a quick look here at the, the numbers, um, if we, for example, looked at this result here, we would see it's within normal, great, excellent, move on. However, if we use this graphing or uh, trending function of VetConnect Plus, in which this gray shaded area here represents a value within the reference interval, you could actually really easily appreciate that over time, motor mouse's creatinine is actually trending upwards within the reference interval, and that's likely to be pretty significant. Um, so it would enable us to detect meaningful change within the reference interval and therefore give us the opportunity to look into this sooner. Thank you for watching this IDEX Continuing Education Series webinar. I hope you leave with a greater appreciation for how population-based reference intervals are created and the merits of creating individual reference intervals for our patients. The VetConnect Plus portal can assist you in easily creating individual reference intervals for your patients. Lastly, remember when interpreting clinical changes in individual analytes, we need to consider the clinical decision limit for the analyte in question, as well as the sample quality, profile collation and patient factors. That is, we always want to be going back and asking ourselves, does the result ultimately make sense for what I know of my patient? Thank you.